name is Heather, and this is another episode of Innocence Lost, my wrongfully conviction series. And as you can see from the thumbnail, the title of this episode is Two Young Men Wrongly ID'd Plus Coerced Confessions. And the gentlemen that we're going to be discussing today are Travis Hayes and Ryan Matthews. So on the screen here, you can see this is Ryan Matthews, so we can distinguish the two of them. And this is Travis Hayes. And let me get the page ready for when I need to pop back over to it. All right, so I'm going to tell you the story about Ryan Matthews and Travis Hayes. Ryan Matthews spent five years in Louisiana, on Louisiana's B. Row for a crime that he did not commit. He was only 17 years old at the time when he was arrested. Matthews was sentenced to the DP, the penalty, for the shooting of a convenience store clerk named Tommy Van Poos, who was in, um, and this took place in Bridgewater, Bridge City, Louisiana. Sorry. Bridge City, Louisiana. So DNA testing results both exonerated Matthews and the idea and revealed the identity of the true perpetrator, but we'll get to that. So first off, Ryan Matthews spent five years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, and Travis spent nine years, or just about nine years, um, when everything was all said and done, and he finally was um, released. So what was the crime? So... In April 1997, a man wearing a ski mask entered Van Hoos's store and demanded money. When Van Hoos refused, the perpetrator shot him four times and fled, taking off his mask and diving into the passenger side window of an awaiting car. Several eyewitnesses viewed the perpetrator's flight. One witness was in her car and watched the perpetrator run from the store fire shots in her direction and leap into a car. When she was later shown a, pic a photographic array, she tentatively identified Matthews as the assailant, so she wasn't sure, but she, she still chose him. By the time of the trial, she was absolutely sure that Matthews was the gunman. And this is just another example of how our memories can change, fade, um, we can even implant false memories, not even knowing it, but like seeing a p picture of somebody on the news repeatedly over and over again, your brain catches that repetition and you think that that's the perpetrator when really it, it wasn't. So it's, and it's so hard to remember, unless you're purposely trying to remember specific details, it's hard to make sure that you're remembering all those details. It's hard to, to identify a person's face. There's so many shapes and faces and, you know, colors out there. It's like, how can you be certain? Especially someone like you just met for a couple seconds. I don't remember people's faces. I'm not good at that. So I don't know. I'm not one of those people that can like remember that I saw someone somewhere recently. I don't know. You know what I mean. All right, so several eyewitnesses viewed the perpetrator's flight, blah, 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 blah. All right, so two other witnesses in the same car watched as the perpetrator shed his mask, gloves, and shirt as he fled. So two other witnesses say that he not only took his mask off, but he took off his gloves and his shirt. I don't understand that either, because then you're leaving your DNA behind, but I guess maybe it wasn't... People didn't care about that so much in the 90s. Although we knew what DNA was at that time. We were using it. So I don't know. The driver claimed to have seen the perpetrator's face in his rear view mirror while he was being shot at and trying to block the escape. This witness and his passenger were brought to a show up hours later. The driver identified Matthews. His passenger was unable to make an identification. So these two witnesses, they saw him shed the mask, gloves, shirt, whatever. And 
they both identify or the driver identified Matthew as the passenger couldn't remember, which is usually probably the better solution than to pinpoint it at somebody who um, might not be the culprit and you your identification could get them thrown in jail. So you might want to be sure before you identify someone that it's really that person. All right, so Ryan Matthews and Travis Hayes, both 17 at the time, were stopped several hours after the crime because the car that they were riding in resembled the description of the getaway car. So that's all. They got pulled over because it was a car that looked like the getaway car. But then what happens? They get arrested. So they are arrested, and Hayes was then questioned for over six hours. In his initial statements to investigators, Hayes claimed that he and Matthews were not in the area when the crime occurred. So that is initial statements, not in the area, crime occurred somewhere else, we weren't there. Um, Hayes eventually confesses that he was the driver of the getaway car, though. So they first claim originally. They were nowhere near the crime scene. Then, somehow, eventually, Hayes confesses to a crime that he didn't do, or confesses to being a getaway driver of a crime that he didn't even do. And neither did his friend. So, there's that. Um, so, Hayes eventually confessed that he was the driver of the getaway car. He stated that Matthews went into the store, shots went off, and Matthews ran out and got into the car. Both boys were described as borderline um, intellectually slow. I'm going to say those words. I don't even know if those are socially acceptable anymore, but that's on the Innocence Project website, these words. Um, so he, neither of them were very intellectually um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. My brain's stopping right now. Um, neither one of them were able to very to to intellectually know what was going on, per se. You might not know that you shouldn't talk to the police without an adult there. You might not know things like that. You might not know that some of the things you're saying could be incriminating, even though they're not. But it sounds like it to a cop who's looking for any excuse to to put you in jail. All right, so Ryan Matthews and Travis Hayes, both 17 at the time, were stopped several hours because their car looked like the description of the getaway car they were arrested, and Hayes was then questioned for over six hours. I read this whole thing, didn't I? Okay. He stated that Matthews went into the store, shots went off, and Matthews ran out. Both boys were described not very mental uh not very intellectually um i don't know you know what i mean all right so in 1999 based mainly on the identifications matthews was convicted of homicide and was sentenced to dp hayes was convicted of second degree homicide and sentenced to life so the one who because travis hayes claimed that matthews was the gunman matthews got sentenced to dp he got the dp hayes however got life in prison for second degree homicide as you know, being part of the getaway driver or whatever, being an accomplice. So Matthews had maintained his innocence since arrest. The defense presented evidence that forensic testing of the mask excluded both Matthews and Hayes. The defense expert also testified that the car that the two boys were driving, the reason they were stopped, could not have been the getaway car because the passenger side window that Matthews allegedly jumped through was inoperable and could not be rolled down. I mean, that is pretty good evidence. Other witnesses to the crime described the shooter as being much shorter than Williams. So now we've got other witnesses that are disputing 
the identification of Matthews. Continued Defense Investigation by William Southern and Clive Stafford Smith of the Louisiana Crisis Assistance Center and DNA testing in another uh, homicide case proved to be the keys to proving Matthew's innocence. Another homicide occurred shortly after Van Hoose's death in the same area. A local resident, Rondell Love, was arrested and pled guilty. Love bragged to other inmates that he also... Hold on one second. I don't know what my dog's barking at, but she's barking. And then, and then the other one's got to bark, too. It's like one starts, the other's got to start. Um, Where was I? Uh, Rondell Love pled guilty. Love bragged to other inmates that he also took the life of Van Hoos, prompting Matthew's attorney attorneys to begin investigating love so yeah i would too dna test results from the second homicide were compared to results from the matthews conviction indicating that love had been wearing the mask that was left behind in the van hoos uh, homicide testing on a mask gloves and shirt had already excluded Matthews and Hayes. So they were already excluded, but yet we're sitting here with them in prison and um, testing some other guys, testing for some other guys' DNA. Uh, but those results became conclusive after Love's profile was included. So it is for sure Love was the perpetrator. Over a year after this information was discovered, Matthews was granted a new trial. He was released in June 2004 on bond as he awaited a new trial. In August 2004, prosecutors asked the court to lift the bond and vacate the conviction. Matthews became the 14th B row inmate in the United States that was proven innocent by post conviction DNA testing. The 14th. That's pretty amazing. Um, so after two more legal battles, Travis Hayes was released in December 2006 and exonerated in 2007. So I'm going to flip over to this tab over here and um, read this last sentence. Okay. So even after Matthews was exonerated, attorneys at the Innocent Project New Orleans fought for two and a half years to bring Hayes back into court. Finally, on December 19, 2006, Hayes was released from prison when his conviction was set aside. What does set aside mean versus thrown out? Is that different? Oh. Prosecutors had 30 days to retry Hayes, that's the difference, but decided to drop all charges against him. Yeah, because you got the wrong people. So, this last little bit is kind of depressing. So Hayes received $252,000 in state compensation. Matthews was awarded $133,000 in compensation, which I think is despicable. You took years of people's lives. And this is like, they were teenage boys. So you're taking like the best years of their lives away from them. And that's awful to me and that deserves so much more money than that compensation right there and at the time it was probably like oh yeah that seems like a lot but in today's dollars I mean it's not and to, to them maybe it was enough maybe it was a lot maybe that was all they were gonna get I don't know it wasn't part of those uh proceedings I would I wonder those would be interesting documents to read over how they settled how the state settled with them, but I don't know if they're available. Anyway, so that is the story of Hayes and Matthews. They have been out now since, what, 2007? So 14, 13 years? Um, so they've been out for a while, um, but it's always good to go over these stories so that we know what happened in the past and we can learn from them and do better in the future. 
So again, he served five years. This was in the state of Louisiana. He had first degree homicide. He was sentenced to the DP. Incident date was 4-5-1997. Uh, he wasn't convicted until two years later, and then he was exonerated in 2004. Those are like all your good years. I feel kind of a connection because I I'm the same age as them, so I feel like those would have been like if I lost all those years, I can't even imagine. Kind of look back and think, you know, think back to your teenage years, your childhood, your, you know, your glory days as a 20-something year old and out partying and having a good old time with your friends. Think about those days and imagine having them taken away from you because some cops are either profiling you or just too lazy to do their job I don't know or they think we got our guy so now we're gonna plant evidence or we're gonna coerce a confession out of you to say that the other guy was the shooter and that's how we're gonna give you a deal and not give you the DP which makes you know I mean I hate that cops are able to lie especially to our youth in these circumstances and it's not right. And 22 hours of being interrogated, that's, that's too much for anyone, let alone a teenage boy whose brain isn't quite developed, and um, especially with their intellectual disabilities also. So it's not, they're not coming to the interview with any cards in their deck. <laughs> I mean, the, the the deck is totally stacked against them. So it's really, and then, and then once they have a conviction, it is so dang impossible to get a conviction overturned. And everybody in society is just like, well, let's, let's just let the courts play it. Let it all play out. You know, if someone's arrested, they're obviously guilty. The, the cops just know what they're doing. And we'll just let the courts work it out. And that's how we're in this mess. We need more transparency and we need people, the people, us, to be paying attention to our surroundings, paying attention to what's going on in our communities, in our cities, and, you know, just in our nation. Even even things that are, you know, states away. Massachusetts, I'm nowhere near in Chicago, but I have been covering the Karen Reed case full force because I'm passionate about that case and I feel like it needs, there's no justice. There's corruption and the cards are definitely stacked against Joe Schmo individual when it comes to me versus a whole police station of ways to try to intimidate me and coerce a confession out of me and to lie to me and to tell me my friend has already told on me and all these things. They mess with your head. They will do anything to get that confession out of you sometimes. It's called the read technique. They will push you and push you psychologically until you break. And the great thing about the read technique is this is the technique that most law enforcement uses today to get a confession. The great thing about it is you can get a confession. The bad thing about it is you can get a confession from someone who actually didn't commit the crime, but they just confess because they've been under so much duress. So I'm going to leave you thinking about that and how unfortunate that is and we want to make sure that these things aren't happening so i urge you to be aware of your surroundings aware of your community your leaders your law enforcement all of that and make sure that uh we the people keep them in line that we that's our job is to keep them in line they're not supposed to be all powerful and you know corrupt over us like um we've been seeing in some of these cases so all right with that, I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. And um, be sure to subscribe for more episodes of Innocence Lost and um, other 
other streams regarding uh, corruption, cover-ups, police overreach, prosecutorial overreach, things like that I'm really interested in and I want to bring more light to. So definitely, if you are interested in that too, hit the subscribe button and let me know what stories you are interested in. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time. Bye now. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeandcourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.